Eddie and I, um, yeah, we, we've, we've reveled in, in discussions about uh, hemp palaces for, for many, many years. And I think this will be a fun opportunity to, uh, to impart some of our love for the, for the systems uh, to you and also talk about the technical side of it. Um, well, the one thing we did not do was figure out who was going to start off. Um, Eddie, do you want to start off and segue into that? Uh, that sure. Next sure. I'm, I'm uh, happy to. Uh, the uh, Hemp Houses hold a, a, a really important place in my life. It was the first theater I worked in, and I worked in that theater, oh, God, and from 1975 until 1998. Um, this is the, th the theater that suffered a lot of damage in the Loma Prieta earthquake. And regretfully, um, while we kept all of the hemp systems, uh, we put in a counterweight system. And uh, so the hemp system hasn't been used quite as extensively. And because of that, the knowledge of how to use it and how to use it effectively has, has dissipated some. But it's the, the components of it are all still there. And uh, there's a certain gestalt to working on a hemp house. It, it's, a, it's a very active, very hands-on process that involves usually teamwork with more than uh, just one person loading and one person pulling ropes. And it, it harkens back to long ago days when uh, a certain knowledge of craft a deep knowledge of craft was really, really important to being successful in what we did. Um, some of that's obviously still true in other areas, but I think this was this was the essence of theater for me growing up. So um, what you're looking at here is a, a pin rail on the left that are two, uh, in this case, and a short third one, a horizontal pieces of uh, round pipe, about six inches in diameter, with holes drilled in it into which belaying pins go. The belaying pins, just like they used to use on the old square riggers when they were rigging. Um, the scenery is hung from uh, hemp. Sometimes we incorporated uh, battens at the business end of the uh, hemp if we're hanging backdrops and things like that. Sometimes we hung directly on the hemp. It depended on the system. Uh, it's really flexible. You can hang things diagonally across the stage with great ease. So uh, at ACT anyway, we used to do a lot of headers for shows that had to fly above the set before we could build the set under it. And we would spot lines above it, counterweight it, use a carpet batten. I think we'll talk about what carpet battens are um, a little later. And then fly in your sandbags, untie them, tie on your header, put the weight back on the line set with the carpet batten and fly it out to trim. And it, it was so smooth and so easy to do. It's, it's labor intense at the front end because on the front end, you have to spot shivs. Um, so I've been in hemp houses around the country where they only spot shivs in the wells, uh, in the grid. But in our house uh, at the Gary Theater, Every show that would come in, we would respot all the shivs. And we would, at the Gary Theater, we did five shows in rotating rep at any given time. And because it was a hemp house, we could actually hang two pieces of scenery in the same ribbon, sometimes one above the other, which meant you brought in the piece you weren't going to use, breasted it out of the way, brought in the second piece, flew out the first piece out of the way, and flew the, the second one underneath it for the show. We, we, we had 60, five about uh, pins spots on each of the upper and lower rails. And at times we would have, including lighting uh, and pipes that just carried cable, we would have 80 to 90 pieces of things hanging from those 65 pins. So it was a pretty active, busy uh, system that we use. Hey, hey, Eddie. Yeah. Did you have a, do you have a sense for the average number of crew fly people on a, on a, on a, on a, on a particular show? Well, on load-ins, uh, a lot of this depended on the size of the pieces we were flying. You know, uh, if you had a really heavy piece, for example, our electric pipes, when we were flying electrics, um, you would have, 
your head flyman and assistant flyman and three or four other people to assist in the uh, tailing of the block and falls when we were doing the lifting. Um, we're, we'll talk about how, okay. how we utilize them. But, you know, the fly crew could be anywhere from two people to six people. Right. For okay. a load in. For a show, it's just depending on how many pieces you need to move at the same time. Right. I but don't know if there's any of the Philadelphia, if there's anybody from Philly on with us today who remembers or who had be, or who worked in Philly, uh, the Nutcracker at the Academy when it was a, a, a hemp house, when they did this, the, the scene change, you know, from the drawing room to Fairyland. Um, I think there was 12 people running the rail. It was yeah, there's it was, a lot of scenery moving then. Uh huh. Okay, I didn't mean to, well, I did mean to interrupt, but go ahead. No, that's fine. I'm Actually, not sure where this this particular um, rail, this photograph is from, to be honest with you. It was in my library, but it was not marked. And I don't know where it's from. Yeah. Anybody wants to hazard a guess, please do. I, I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting in this picture, the, the number of block and falls that are hanging. Yeah. Um, generally, when you... If you're not going to be moving a piece in and out, you don't necessarily have to put a sandbag on to counterweight it. You raise and lower it with the block and fall um, and a Sunday that's wrapped around the line set. And that looks like what they've done here. Those are probably lighting pipes or something that don't, once they're trimmed, they don't move. So they're tied off to the block and fall and they didn't bother to put a sandbag. The sandbags are those things on the right made out of canvas and they can weigh anywhere from 20 pounds to 400 pounds. And that's how you counterweight your scenery by hanging a sandbag on the line set. Um, but this one's interesting because we, we didn't usually leave the block and fall on. I think we didn't have that many block and falls. <laughs> so you would tie the piece off, trim it, tie it off and just walk, leave it there and recover your block and fall to use someplace else. Right. Well, that was a, that was a lesson in economics. That's, that's what that was. It was. And, you know, because these are really heavy pieces, a lot of times you're using a three to two block and fall and you only had a couple of those because, you know, you don't need a three to two block and fall. Um, there, it's a lot of work to use one because you don't get as much lift every time you extend the block and bring it block to block after pulling on the working line, just because uh, it's a five to one. So you only get one fifth of the lift every time you collapse the blocks. So you have to reset. Oh. Is that a question or was that just a comment? <laughs> uh, I think that was a, an extraneous sound there. OK. Uh, someone's asking if we use uh, capstans to rig heavy units. Um, we didn't have a mechanical capstan. We had a hand cranked capstan. Um, this actually adapted from sailing, uh, but it was a six inch diameter capstan. And we would take the, uh, if it was a really heavy piece, um, sometimes we'd use the working line from the block and fall. Sometimes we just used a piece of braided Dacron that was attached to the Sunday and wrap the dated braided Dacron around the capstan winch and then tail it off around a couple of pins so that we can control it. Um, and with somebody cranking the winch, somebody tailing the winch, and somebody manning the wraps for safety, um, you could get a one-to-one -one lift on it that way, which made it a lot faster. So you didn't have to reset a block and fall to get to trim. Right. So yeah, we did use a hand crank capstan winch. Yeah. Would you would you d define tailing for the? For the oh, um, you would bring your. Uh, your working line, whether it's the block and fall working line or the piece of Dacron down to the lower rail that you see in the picture here. And we would use a snatch block, which is a block that you can open and lay the line inside of and then close the block. And the person who would be out of the way, usually upstage from where you were, was pulling on that line while, while the capstan winch was working. So they were, they were taking care of the loose end of the rope to make sure that it stayed orderly and that uh, they could also then assist in the lift. It was, if it was a straight one-to-one -one lift, like with a block and fall, they could assist with the lift, but not be in the way. Um, 
and they would tail that line. The person at the end that had a wrap around a belaying pin on the rail was really there just for safety. If anything went wrong, if we lost our grip, uh, if the winch failed or anything, we had a secondary backup to catch whatever the load was. So they would take a double wrap on a belaying pin. And if anything happened, they could cinch it down and catch the load. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think go to the second picture. We can come back to this if we want. This is kind of just a basic diagram of uh, a hemp house rigging. So you have a batten sometimes. Um, at the Geary Theater, we often did not use battens. That just added weight to the system that you had to counterweight. If you didn't need a batten uh, for hanging um, a drape on or hanging a lights on, then oftentimes we would just bring the hemp straight down to the piece we were going to fly. So if we're flying a hard flat, we would bring it through the D-ring at the top and then tie it to the D-ring at the bottom and trim it that way and not have to add the weight of a batten from which we hung it. This also had to do whether or not we wanted to, the hemp would top of the flat was out of sight lines because you don't usually want to see the hemp. But those would go through the loft blocks as in any system, go over head block and come down to the pin rail. Um, What's interesting in this picture is it has a picture of a jack line. Uh, in, in this picture, it's called a jack line. What we used to call it was a haul down line. And in this picture, the shift for the jack line is off stage of the head blocks. We used to try to get that, that shift as close to the head block as possible. So it was a vertical pull rather than an angle like it is in this picture. Um, that line, that haul down line or jack line was used to raise and lower the Sunday to which your block and fall was attached so that you could attach your block and fall to the Sunday, attach your haul down line or your jack line to one side of the Sunday. Um, usually we'll have a picture of a Sunday in a minute, but it's a, it's a prosec knob where you pass a cow hitch, where you pass one end of a loop through itself and it grips around the line set. Um, the vertical line would be tied around one of the pieces of the Sunday next to the line set. And the, the block and follow would be tied to the loop that you'd pass through. And the other line would be tied to the bottom line of the one going through the line set. The idea is when you pull on the line, it opens up the Sunday so you can slide that Sunday up and down the line set. And then when you pull on the block and fall, it cinches around the line set and you can haul the piece out that way. Um, so Bill sent, Bill sent me to, to a uh, hemp house that was being run a uh, couple of years ago to do a training for them because they weren't really sure what they were doing. And we went up on the fly loft and they didn't have any haul down or jack lines. So I said, well, how do you guys attach your Sundays to the line set to do your block and falls? I said, oh, we send somebody to the grid and they wrap chain around the line set and then we hang the line set and they pull it down and then we undo it and they haul it back up. So we have somebody in the grid the whole time. So I demonstrated, we rigged a jack line and we demonstrated how to use a Sunday. And they were just stood back and went, oh my God, that's magic. How does that work? <laughs> It was, it was quite gratifying. Yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> but what's, what's great about this system is, depending on the size of your load and, and the leverage you have with your block and fall, one or two people can lift a very heavy load this way, using a mechanical advantage with the block and fall, resetting the Sunday every time they collapse the block and fall. So if I'm using a two to one block and fall and, and I'm only getting a third of the lift every time I collapse the block and the fall with the, with the load on stage. So I have to reset that. But by using the jack line, it's very quick and easy to do that. And two people can lift, you know, 400, 500 pounds this way. Um, so ultimately the jack line is there to position your Sunday so that you have operating space. Is that a fair assessment? It's there to run this when you're loading in or setting the pieces there to run the Sunday up and down the line set. Right. Um, once you've got your counterweight sandbag hung on the line set, you tie your your jack line or your haul down line to the sandbag and it actually allows you to lift the sandbag. If you have a balanced system, you can't push rope up. You have to actually lift the sandbag to make the piece come in on the other end. So we would use the jack line 
uh, tied to one end tied to the sandbag to actually lift the sandbag and cause the piece to then come into into the scenic area into the right. theater, theater, and then we could pull the line set to pull the piece back out. So it had a double function. It was also a way to lift sandbags. Yep. Into position so that you could hang them on the line set. Whether you're using a Sunday, a rolling hitch, a, a clamp, there are a number of ways to hang a sandbag on a line set. Yep. But I like this graphic because it's really basic. And yeah, unfortunately, it's it's any larger and it pixelates right on out. You can't read anything. Right. Yeah. Did, where, sorry, where, go ahead. Go ahead. Which hand pass did you work in, Bill? Um, I worked in a number of them. Um, the, the the earliest one was a place called Plays and Players in Philadelphia on Delancey Street. It was ah. uh, one of the oldest temp houses. The Academy of Music was the oldest. I never actually worked there. I was I, I stopped in. I was visiting every once in a while for shows, but I was never on the crew um, to get on the crew for um, uh, for the Academy. Um, you, you 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 had to wait your turn. And, right. and that that took a while. How old was it? I'm sorry. When was it built? The Academy of Music. Um, it's 200 years old. Now. Wow. Yeah. You know, it's one of the oldest theaters in the country. The yeah. other, the oldest theater in the country, which is, uh, which started out as a hemp house and converted some of their stuff to, to counterweight but it's still kind of a hybrid is uh, the Walnut Street Theater in uh, also in Philadelphia. Yeah. Oh. And I've worked, I worked there a lot also. Yeah, the Gary's only 110 years old, so. Right. Um, but that's old. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you guys use the same system for lifting and lowering? Well, the system that you're describing is what was used in the Academy. It's a big hall. Um, so, you know, there was, there was a lot of weight and there was a lot, of, a lot going on. Um, so you had to, you had to be pretty concise and you had to be careful and uh, mindful of your, of the geography, um, the place and players, which was uh, a club started out as some kind of a theater club way back when, as I said, it's almost as old as the Academy. Um, it's a tiny little space. And uh, they weren't mindful of much of anything there. So <laughs> we actually, we actually had to go in and uh, uh, we didn't, well, it wasn't maybe we closed them down, but but we made them get engineering report work done on the on the wooden grid uh, before they hung. They wanted to hang a really big show, and we wouldn't do it until they got engineering stuff done. Good idea. Hey, can you go back to that first picture? That one. And I was hoping it would show a picture of the basket. As you can imagine, when you're, if you've got a five line set and you have a 80 foot grid, you're going to end up with five pieces of rope that you're never going to use once the, sh the piece is hung um, that are going to be 40, 40 feet long or so that you have to do something with. So in front of the pin rail, generally, and you can see a little bit of it on the upstage part of this picture. Um, on the floor, you have this giant pile of hemp. In the, in the old days, hemp, right? Manila hemp rope. And that rope, because it was a natural fiber, had a tendency to rot if it didn't get enough air flowing around it. And so most of the hemp houses had a wire mesh basket that was hung off the front of the fly loft into which you could coil neatly or sometimes not so neatly uh, all of the excess rope you had on each of the line sets. So if you have 60 line sets and each line is each line set is five lines and you've got 40 feet of line on each uh, tail, that's a lot of rope to have to manage at any given time. So during a load in, all that rope is on the floor where you're walking. Literally, you are walking on 8, 10, 12 inches of hemp on the floor because in a big load in, you don't have time to dress all that stuff properly. You can't coil it up on the pins because you're still trimming things. So it's just on the floor. 
So, you know, OSHA would probably not approve that as a, as a good walking, working surface for us. But um, the basket became a really uh, important way of keeping our hemp healthy while we're using it. Because what you don't want is it to rot. And as Jay Glarum was often uh, fond of um, saying, you know, manila hemp is just an organized compost heap, right? <laughs> it's a natural right. fiber. And if it doesn't breathe right, it's going to start developing heat and it's going to start decaying. Right. And if you've ever been in a hemp house, you can smell decaying hemp. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sarah. Let me let me interrupt for just a second. Sarah yeah. did. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for doing this. She did uh, the research. The Walnut Street Theater opened in 1808. Plays and Players uh, opened 100 years ago. So it's 100 years old. And the Academy, Academy of Music opened in 1857. Uh, someone was asking what the origin of that picture was. That graphics from the Stage Rigging Handbook by Jig Larum. Um, this graphic. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I freely steal from that book all the time, yeah. <laughs> but I had Jay's blessing to do so. so. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Go into another picture, I guess. You want to go? Let's go here. Okay. Woo. Yeah. Head blocks. Head blocks. This is. Um, is this the Academy? Yes, this is the Academy of Music. It's no longer a hemp house, by the way. They changed that back in 2001. And I got in there a couple of days before they started tearing this stuff out and took a bunch of photos. But this is a typical um, head block installation. Well, it's only semi-typical. Um, the style of head block, the stacked block, um, you know, this is one whole assembly. And I've got a, I think, yeah, there's one from somewhere else. But the shivs are stacked in the block. Um, so they drop down to the floor, down through this hole, nice and neatly. Uh, in this particular system, which is in New England, actually, um, the top and the bottom are lag screwed to, to a wooden vertical here and to the wooden deck here. Interestingly enough, what they did at the Academy is they made a, a, a bolt, a U-bolt assembly around uh, a pipe that they ran up and down stage and the top of these guys all um all you bolted to that pipe uh it's the only place i've ever seen anybody do that um and i'm sure they had a reason and uh, i don't know why well it's strong yeah yeah um you know I, i've only seen a head block in a hemp house fail once and literally what happened was the top lag bolt pulled out of the the brace that it had right but it was it had a two thousand pound piece of scenery hang on it right and we had four head blocks stacked side by side because we had a lot of pieces of line lifting mm -hmm. and uh it just ripped right out sure well that i think the, i think the advantage with this u-bolt and pipe assembly is you know if you've got a bunch of head blocks and as you mentioned earlier the tendency is to move them around because you want to maintain that flexibility if that's a piece of wood that they're they're uh, lag bolting in after a while it starts looking like swiss cheese it gets all perforated from the various locations of the head blocks and uh, either the wood is going to just let go uh, or you're going to pull a lag bolt out of a soft piece where you were kind of near or next to a uh, a previous lag bolt, lag bolt hole. Mm -hmm. one, one of the practices when we're running the rope through the head blocks, and again, <clears throat> one of the great things about hemp houses and one of the disadvantages because it's so labor intense is that you're regularly pulling all the rope out and putting all the rope back, and especially in a place where you're doing um, a rotating repertory where you're not relying on fixed battens. A lot of hemp houses, they just hung battens and they would hang, hung, just like a counterweight house, they would hang 40 or 50 battens. And that's where they hung everything from. And you did, they didn't take advantage of the flexibility of the system. But when you're re reaving the lift lines through the head blocks, you always put your long line on the top head block and then your long center on the one below that and the center in the middle block 
your short center below that and your short line on the bottom. So you, the flyman who's looking up at the head block from below can tell when he needs to, he or she needs to trim a pipe, which line to pull on. Okay, because right. w once you get your pipe up to stage level and you've taken a wrap around your pin, at, or I should say at eye level, and you're taking a wrap around your pin, often what happens when you're lifting it with a block and fall on a Sunday is lines will, t because the lines aren't evenly loaded necessarily, they're going to, some of them are going to slide through the Sunday. And once you get the pipe at eye level or the top of your flat at eye level, you need to put, jerk on the lines to pull them through the uh, Sunday and through the head blocks so that you can then trim the piece level again and re-level it. If you've done this, read everything through the head blocks in an orderly way, it's very easy to look up and see which line you're pulling on. Right. Line set. We, solved, we solved that problem in the mid, early to mid nineties. Um, this is the Academy and we sold them um, I think the, the technical term is a metric crap load of uh, synthetic rope. Uh -huh. um, and if you look at the various ropes here, the top ropes have a red tracer. Yeah. There's a darker tracer here and there would be a different color tracer here so that if you knew if they ran them correctly and if you knew that, you know, red, uh, that the red was your long line and, and you know, blue was your short line. Uh, it was easy to 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 identify which one you needed to to yank on uh, at the uh, at the Sunday. Yeah, at the Gary, you're going to laugh at this. Um, we actually dipped the ends of the each of the line in uh, dye, and we dyed the lines from, according to the colors of the spectrum from red to purple <laughs> across the stage because we stored our hemp in the grid. We had a racks. Um, on the concrete uh, trusses in the grid. And we would store the, all the lines up there. And you wanted to be able to, when you're running a line, to make sure you had a long line in your hands. And you could just look at the ends of the line, know which one you had. Right. Because they vary in length from long to short, obviously. Yeah. So, cool. yeah. But, I, you know, this was in the, well, from the 70s up until the early 90s, uh, after the earthquake was in 89. So from when I started in 75 until 89, that was how we did everything. Right. When we first started set, put, switching manila or hemp uh, out for a synthetic, we actually had solid colored braided. It would, they were double, it's double braided line, but the core was had a solid color, which made wow. it even easier. But we, you know, over a couple of years, we didn't buy enough of it from the manufacturer to warrant their continuing to do that. So then they just tra switched over to the uh, the tracer color. Cool. But it was it was great when it was a solid color because it was really easy. Was that braided line? Yes, it's double braided. You know. How did that How did that work with Sundays? Worked great. You would yeah. think it wouldn't. It worked great. Cable yeah, Sunday, three sixteenths. Yeah, I would think the the sleeve would slide, but nope, not yeah. Nope, it you know you get it might have slid if you've got like a really lightweight thing and the Sunday's not grabbing terribly, Hard. terribly strongly, but you know you got a couple hundred pounds on there and it's going to grab everything in that line and the the the, the shells not and the core they're not going to move on each other. Yeah, as somebody noted in the chat, when you're when you're dealing with miles and miles and miles of rope, yeah. organization, you know, uh, uh, what do they call it in cooking? Mise en place. Everything is in its place. Yes. Right? So that you can keeping it all untangled and straight and easy to troubleshoot is really, really key. Yeah. And it, it was a great lesson, not just for rigging, which it, it, that's very important in all rigging applications, but for everything in theater, you know, that, that idea that as if you're thinking about the loadout while you're doing the load in, you're going to save yourself tons and tons of work. <laughs> right. I'm trying to find, I don't know if this picture will give you an idea of organization or not. Yes. Well, it That's gives you an, an idea of how much line there there you can be involved. Um, the on stage in this image is to the left. 
so you've got you've got um, what would be on the on the on the right side of the image you've got bag lines and jack lines and your um, your line sets are on the left side of the page right and if you didn't keep things neat you were in deep deep trouble right there's right, a lot let's go of back to the head blocks and we'll get we'll get through some of the gear here but i gotta so i think that's where i was yep yeah down what's this one yeah this is just gives you another idea yeah. now this is a really small theater they've got 19 counterweight 19 hemp sets and uh, they're using uh, they're not using a double braid they're using a uh, three strand twisted it's a multi-line and uh I prefer personally. I prefer the double braid. It's interesting on that head block too, because the the way it's built, you can only put that head block where those vertical pipes come through or vertical boards come through. Yeah. So you have no flexibility built into that kind of a head block rack. No, no. They this was this was what as you said earlier. This who was. Um, see you later, Eddie. Um, Bye, Eddie. Uh, not not you, Eddie Raymond. You got. I know the other Eddie. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a, a, a small university venue and they treated it like a counterweight system, you know, right. like, you know, any counterweight system, it's not, it has no flexibility to it at all. Right. I think this is, oh, this was a photo that you came up with. Yeah. It's another one from Jay's, one of Jay's books. Right. Um, there's two kinds of head blocks here. One, uh, the one on the top is, um, has a single shaft and a bunch of pulleys on it th that uh, all of your lines run over. And the one on the bottom is the ones we've been describing uh, in previous that sh and it shows in with the arrows, uh, how the ropes are run over the shivs and down to the pin rail from the loft blocks. So it's just an easy and you can see on this one uh, on the bottom that horizontal timber at the top that the head blocks are all attached to allows you flexibility in where you put your head blocks. Yeah, that one. Yeah, that one. That I'm, one. Doing my, I'm doing my Vanna White imitation. here. I like that. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, loft blocks in that university theater. Um, so, you know, there's really not much going on here. Oddly enough, and I think it's a safety thing. Well, I know it's a safety thing, but they covered the entire thing with mesh. Um, OSHA would be very happy with that. I'm sure. I'm sure. It makes, it, it, it makes the flexibility of the hemp house pretty much um, impossible. Right. Because not being able to put the shiv anywhere on the grid, uh, dropping through any one of those, between any two of those ribbons, uh, is one of the beauties of the system. Right. Um, and being able to mount shivs diagonally so you can hang things diagonally across your stage. Um, if you do this, that sort of takes that flexibility away. Yep. But it does keep students from stepping through the holes. Yeah, yeah, and, and it provides a certain level of comfort, I think. Yeah. Yeah, a couple of lag bolts, that's it, you know. Okay, what do we got here? Ah, this is, the, the, this is, we got a couple of art shots. These are um, uh, the loft blocks in the Academy of Music. Um, the old I style open I have, I have a uh, I have a starship mounted to a piece of zebra wood that was given to me when I retired. <laughs> right. And I have one of these mounted to a piece of black walnut that serves as the um, stump the rigger trophy. Oh, that's right. Yeah. The, again, the Academy of Music, you can see how um, it starts to get a little crowded up there really quickly. What's interesting in this picture is you can see a couple of loft blocks that are mounted perpendicular to the other ones. Um, those might be for spot lines. Those may also be for hanging things uh, like uh, a tab pipe where you want to hang your tabs from. Um, I don't see any lines running through them at this point, but they might, you know, that's how you would typically do that. And then you run into a mule shove, which then you, you kick back to a head block. Right. Um, Mule shivs just allow you to, to gather all the lines coming from different angles and direct them into a single head block. Yeah, I, would do, I, would want, I was going to use this one to show you the different tracer colors. Yeah. 
this is this is more art than anything else now remember that I took this shot in I guess 2001 days before all this was taken out and converted to a counterweight system so this hemp is old it's really really old I think if you just walked onto the fly gallery you didn't even have to touch a rope, but you just walk onto the fly gallery and you got five splinters in each hand <laughs> just, just just by being there. Which brings up an interesting point. Um, do you know about the Becker scale? Tell us, Eddie. Um, hemp is graded. Uh, most hemp is built in the Philippines and it is graded on what's called a Becker scale. And the Becker scale, I think, goes from 10 to 60. Um, the higher the number, the softer, more pliable the hemp and the fewer slivers. The lower the number, the less expensive, the stiffer and the more splintery the hemp is. So when we would get new hemp for the Geary, which we did on a regular basis, um, we had a we had a rotation for swapping out lines every year. We would replace so many of the lines, uh, so many of the each of the short short center center long center long lines every year um, as a group so that we could keep track of how old our hemp was and we ne tried never to have a piece of hemp in the house longer than five or six years if we could um, this this hemp's probably been hanging there for lo much longer um, it was just because it was such an active house and we were using everything so much and putting such a strain on every piece of line that we owned that it was the only way to guarantee that what we had was uh, and still in good working order. But we would call up the rope uh, vendors and order a specific Becker number. We would try to get it somewhere between uh, 45 and 50 if we could. Um, the other stuff was prohibitively expensive. It was used for decoration uses elsewhere. Um, and the lower stuff was used for um, old hawsers and anchor lines and things like that that didn't get handled as much but the stuff we wanted we wanted to be fairly pliable and not have a lot of slivers in it you still got slivers you know when when i first started dating my wife when i was a stagehand working in the on the fly floor in the geary theater uh it was back back in the days of pantyhose and uh touching her knee with my hand was a disaster it made them run every single time so you just keep your hands to yourself. It's not that I don't want you to touch me. I just don't want you to ruin my clothes. Um, <laughs> and, you know, you, just, you, uh -huh. you could tell you could tell the hemp house because everybody who worked on the rail was sitting around in the prop room during the show, pulling splinters out of their hands and volunteering to do the dishes after the show. Right. To soften up the calluses so you could shave them off. Yeah, I think I was I, I, I was working in theaters that had, you know, the Bechter scale was in negative numbers, I think. <laughs> but this is also a good demonstration of how the show length of your line set can be stored, right? You you have two, usually you have two pin rails. You have a high one and a low one. The low one is for the low trim on your piece of scenery or your uh, drop or whatever it is. So when you lower in the line, uh, that it becomes taut on the lower pin rail. Um, there's actually, if you look at this, there's three pin rails in this. There's one way on stage, um, another one close by, and then the lower one below. I imagine that that second one, the one in the middle is the one they use for their low ties. I'm guessing, because the other one on the bottom doesn't run the whole length. Yeah. But you would So you tie your low tie at the low pin and your um, when you pull the piece out and you tie it off to the upper pin, just like in a counterweight house, you have a stab or a mark, trim mark on your line set that lines up with the top of the belaying pin. So when it's in storage position, you'd be tied off to that. And you have a length of line set that goes between the two pins that you have to store to get out of the way during the show. So in that one picture, they had coiled it up and they just literally put it over the top of the pin like this um, and that's a great way to store hemp uh, one of the other things when you get five or six or even seven line sets where you've got so much rope you can't get the coil over the top of the pen we used to make a sunday out of trick line 
put put one loop over the top of the pin, put the other through your coil of cable and put the second loop over the pin. So it was real easy to undo. You just flipped it off and it, you had your lines ready to go for your, for the cue that you're going to run with that piece of scenery. Um, there's a number of tricks you can use for hanging the excess. But again, it gets back to managing it so you're not walking on it, you're not tripping on it, and it never gets tangled up when you get ready to run your show, your line set. Yeah, nothing like getting dragged by the foot up in the air. No, that's not fun. Not a whole lot of fun. And Lord knows it happens. Why don't we go here? There's a good one. And we talk about how to properly tie off. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. Um, a lot of people have a lot of different ways of tying off. Um, the idea, well, there's two principles that I follow here. One is to always be in control. So you always, always know when you're going to, you personally, your hands are going to feel the weight of the piece, you know, if it's out of balance or, you know, if it's been set uh, piece heavy on purpose, whatever, you need to, to maintain control and know when you're going to get that weight. Um, and the other thing is you want to walk into any house and look at the rail and be able to know exactly what you've got, you know, so when you're going to tie it or untie it, um, you're doing it the same way that you did the night before in the theater in Des Moines or wherever you were, you know, you know you're, you're touring or whatever. And while a lot of people do it a lot of different ways, this is um, the, what I would consider the, the prescribed manner. This is the way that you really want to do it. And we're working from left to right here. So you've got your, 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 your running line here and your tail. And what you do is and the tail is a lot longer than this. We've, it's been cut off for, for clarity. But so this one, they've run from right to left around the back of the, the bottom pin and then up and around the behind the top of the pin. And then you do it again. So you go behind and behind there. You've created that figure eight, right? So as you come down and you come, you come down and you, as you come down, and come back up for the third time, you flip the rope, laying the, um, the running line over the tail and put it on the top pin and you're done. Now I've seen people that do uh, lots of figure eights. I'll so put three or four figure eights on there, or they'll do that flip by putting the running line over the tail two or three times. You only need to do it once you do the wrap, around the pin twice and then the flip and the reason for that is it's going to hold the wraps are what holds the line that's going to hold the out of weight condition and it will hold an out of weight condition up to the capacity of whatever that line is right? or or the pin whichever is weaker all right and the 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 thing the if the control part of it is that when you want to take this off all you need to do is take your hand, in this case, because of the way it's laid, I would put my left hand up against and push against the wraps here and take the take this off, this section off. It's not doing anything but keeping the rope, you know, from flapping in a breeze. All the tension is create all the is, the force is held right through the uh, the under under wraps, if you will. So you push on here, you loosen this off and take it off. And then you can start taking off the wraps that are actually around the pin, going to that point where you're comfortable holding it and you're going to let it in or do whatever it is that you need to do. But you're always in control. If, you know, I, I take a couple of these wraps off and I'm holding on to this and it starts to move on me, all I have to do is step either to the, my right or my, to my left whichever way, whichever side of the pin you're on and pull the rope across the wraps. And that creates enough friction to hold the load for you. And so it's, 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 it's not a complicated thing. People tend to make it complicated because they think it needs to hold better. It doesn't need, you don't need to do that. You got 
you know, you got the, 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 the wrap and the flip here. It's going to hold whatever you need it to hold. The rope will break before the wraps turn loose. The other thing I want to point out, and people especially in, in houses where the pins are loose, you know, in some houses it's a metal rail uh, and the, the, the pins are welded in. You want to be in the habit of always leaving a wrap around the bottom and the top of the pin. You don't ever want to take that off. I see people, you know, they got a relatively lightweight piece of scenery, so they take it and unwrap it all the way down to the bottom, and they run it through around the bottom uh, uh, of this pin. Well, you know, they're running it through, and, you know, maybe you got a 40 or a 50-foot drop. That's enough time to get that pin and spin it and spin it right out. And once you spin it out, you have a problem. You know, and now you have to decide whether you're going to hold onto the rope or grab the pin that's now in the air and about to go over the side of the rail down to the deck below. So if you want to make sure that the pin doesn't come out, you always leave the top wrap in. You never take it off. It doesn't matter how lightweight the scenery is or whatever it is that you're moving. Yeah, what they leave only, out, Eddie? The only variation I would say is if I'm hanging a 20-pound sad bag, I'm not going to do three wraps. I'm going to do the initial wrap and then the finish wrap um, instead of doing the third one because there's no okay. load on it. Um, but you're absolutely right. When, you, when you're when you taking it off, you always leave those last two wraps on. Even with something really light, you just never know. And it gives you complete control and the pin never comes out. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. And I, 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 I know that some people say it doesn't really matter strength wise it's true it doesn't matter whether you start on the right or start on the left but as a matter of consistency on any given line set or any given theater it's a great idea to always do it the same way so that anybody who comes up there knows what they're grabbing when they grab it they don't have to think about it yeah stage hands get in trouble when they think so, yeah. interestingly uh, enough or we can keep them from thinking the better so I, I we always did it the way it's pictured here start on the right uh, go to the left behind the pin, cross, go across the top. Right. Interestingly enough, on every theater on the East Coast that I, every hemp house that I've been in, where the pins have been tied, where the rope's been tied off to the pin properly, it's been left to right. Interesting. So maybe this side of the, of, of, of the country does it left to right and you're right to left. And, <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what they're doing in the Midwest. But I'm not sure... This is the other direction. Yeah, this is left to right. So I would have seen this, the way they've taken this. This is actually a better image. I would not do this. I would have taken and they did the flip here over the over the uh, the running line. No. And I would have taken. Oh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm seeing that wrong. Yeah, so, you're. I think you're seeing it wrong. I'm seeing it wrong. Yeah. yeah. So we would take another wrap around the bottom pin, come back up, and flip the line over the running uh, over the running over the uh, take the running line over the uh, tail sorry but that's probably a clearer image it's just yeah. not a completed image they right. didn't go, they didn't finish it off but it, it does, it's just as strong left right as it is right to left yes and it's just you know the whoever the flyman is in that house is the one who gets to pick yep and the, and the idea is you don't want any surprises. Yeah. Did you ever work with Sonny Del Vecchio? Say it again. You ever work with Sonny Del Vecchio? I know who he is. I don't think I've, I, no, I've never uh, worked with him. We played at the Stratford on Avon uh, house, which is a hemp house. Mm -hmm. And um, Sonny went up the ladder once a day, as is the habit of most old flymen and came down the ladder once a day. Deaf as a doornail. A dormouse, and you know, he, could, he, he couldn't hear his shivs. It was scree screaming in the grid, but you know, he ran. He had a very nicely, neatly laid out uh, hemp house there. It was fun because we had a crew coming from the west coast, working with a crew from the east coast in an old hemp house. It was a lot of fun. I bet we had a great time. And no blood, huh? And no blood. Excellent. Yeah. Let's see where we're going from here. Ooh, sandbags. Yes. Look. A sandbag. 100 pounder by the looks of it. Uh, yeah, 100, 125. Yeah. The, um, 
Yeah, the, this is a good demonstration of hanging a sandbag on a, on a line set. Um, in this particular one, what they've done is they've hung the sandbag directly onto the Sunday. Uh, the Sunday's wrapped around the, this looks like a two line set, maybe a three line set, I can't tell. Um, and then they put a shackle through the Sunday and then they hung the, attached the shackle to the top of the rings on the, the steel rings on top of the bag. And that's your counterweight. And that extra piece of line that, that's running parallel with the line set is the bag haul or the haul down or the jack line um, that allows you then to get the piece moving. Um, a lot of times in a hemp house with smaller loads, we would make it a little piece heavy so maybe 20, 25 pounds piece heavy. So when you untied it, you could simply let the piece run in. Obviously controlling the speed, but you could let the piece run in. And then to haul the, the piece of scenery out of sight, you would just pull the bag back down. And 20, 25 pounds is not too bad to haul. Um, but when you have bigger pieces or when they're evenly balanced, you have to get that sandbag moving. So that other piece of rope there allows you to lift the sandbag up and bring the scenery in at the same time. This is one way to tie off a sandbag to a line set. Uh, in San Francisco, at theater next door was the Curran Theater next door to the Geary, and the flyman there was Tom Kenny. Tom was uh, actually a Navy splicer. He, they, Navy flew him all over the world to splice uh, cable for for ships um he would supervise crews doing that but he came up with another way of hanging sandbags and what it was was a length of hemp that was probably five feet long uh, they could be different lengths depending on how many lines you were wrapping it had an eye splice in either end um, one of the eye splices had a thimble in it so you would hold the one eye splice up against the line set and wrap the second one around it and then take the thimble die and pass it through the unthimbled die and you would hang your sandbag on that. Effectively what you're doing is you're creating a rolling hitch by wrapping the line set with your rope. And and what it was nice about that as opposed to a cable Sunday is it didn't damage the rope at all. A cable Sunday like this has a tendency to bite into the rope and it'll raise a lot of uh, fibers in the rope if you especially in the old hemp ropes. You know yeah, it's not yeah. obviously synthetic it's not a big a deal. No, and I, I, I was I was going to point out at some point. And this is a good time um, when they took out the synthetic line that they had run in the academy, and the, the synthetic line had been in there for ten or twelve years. Uh, we took some of it and sent it back to the to the manufacturer, and they put it on their test bed, and all of it still broke at specified, you know, at at, at its regular normal breaking strength. And how old was it? Sundays, the Sundays, which is what they used a, a lot of. It right. had really no appreciable effect on the line at all. Wow. I, I, I think maybe, and I, I suspect that almost everybody here knows what we, when we keep saying Sundays, but I want to just make sure for maybe a couple of people who don't. Uh, it's a loop. Um, typically, it's a, it's a loop of cable, wire rope, um, that has been created by... You take a couple of uh, compression sleeves, you know, Nycopress sleeves, and um, you, you run the lines through the ends opposing each other, and it goes through two sleeves, crimp them up, and now you've created a, a loop that's usually about 36 inches long. Um, yeah, I've, seen, a, I've seen them use it with uh, uh, wire. 12, 12 to 18 inches in diameter, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, that, we, we didn't, we did some of them with Nycopress or compression sleeves. Sometimes, um, the old ones that, um, the flyman I learned under made, and he was a flyman back in the thirties and forties. Uh, he was at the end of his career. We would take a, he would take a length of three sixteenths cable and he would peel out one of the strands right. and then he would reweave it. Uh, retwisted around itself um, the seven times you needed to make uh, and then he would splice the ends back into the center so you had an endless uh, an endless piece of wire yeah it was a, it was a smooth piece of wire he didn't have the uh, obstructions of the compression sleeves right yeah
and back in the, the that day you didn't have compression sleeves right no. when he was doing it but we were using some of his that were they've been there i think since the 30s or 40s and they were still completely usable functional no problem yeah with any of them cool yeah let's see what we got here actually you know one more thing about the the sundays um, if you have a Sunday with, sometimes you make them with a knot even, sometimes you make it with compression sleeves, never put your knot or your compression sleeve in the wrap around the rope. Oh, it yeah, always yeah. has to be hanging on your loose end because that, that lump of compression sleeve or knot prevents the line, the Sunday from grabbing the rope the way it's right. supposed to. Yeah, you always want it somewhere in the body of the, uh, of the Sunday, not at the, not at, at the end. Yeah, so where is that picture? No, oh, the next slide is the picture, right? This one? Yeah. This is the Sunday knot. This is how you tie a Sunday if you ever happen to do that. I've, I've actually done this in aircraft cable using uh, this knot. And we the only thing we would do is after we pull it tight is we wrap some electrician's tape or friction tape around the ends of the cable just to keep it neat, neat and orderly so it, can, it can't unravel that way. That knot actually works really efficiently, um, even in aircraft cable. I wouldn't do it in 3 8 aircraft cable, but you know, in 8th inch or 3 16 it works just fine. And then the picture below, he's wrapping the line set uh, with the Sunday, passing one end of the Sunday through the other. Um, and typically, we would just do one wrap. Right. Because you need to be able to pull it open so you can slide it up and down the line set to reset your block and fall when you're hauling out heavy pieces of scenery. Moving on? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Batten clamps. Batten clamps. Um, my, my, my Finnish friends, one of whom is at least was with us, I'm not sure if he's still here, but they call these scissors. Oh, do they? Yep. Interesting. Because the, what 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 happens is this is it's a flexible connection. These two open up, and when you pull on it, they close. So as long you know you know if there's no if if you've got no weight no no weight hanging on it, you can open and close it. But you put a batten in there, and then this is designed for the the old opera style wooden battens. Uh, you put weight on it, and the more tension you put on it, the tighter it becomes and it, it, it cannot open. They're ingenious. But what you don't want to do is you don't want to put one of the, you don't want to put the batten on the floor. If you need, if you want to keep the, the, the batten in the clamp, don't put it on the floor because then all the batten clamps go, um, go slack and they open up. Right. Um, all right. I, 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 uh, Bill, there was a ring around ours that you'd slip on and it had a pin and he'd lock it in oh okay cool i yeah, didn't, wasn't that lucky the ones we had oh. had a collar that's right on the top right i think this is the collar right here but the collar when it went down it turned and it locked in place right yeah yeah there was like a loose pin not a loose pin but a set pin Interesting. anyway yeah, I, I, what, I, I, long ago and far away, I, uh, I brought I, this bed in, it, it, and and it just needed to sit, you know, down low to the floor. We were hiding it upstage to right. the next scene or the next act, I forget which. And I let it in too far, and the batten clamps all hit the floor. The lines went slack, <laughs> and they let go of the piece. When I went to take the piece out, um, the, 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 the batten clamps came out, but not the piece. It was embarrassing. Oh, well, I mean, I think not everybody understands about putting it on the floor either. When you tie a piece of uh, bat, uh, pipe for a batten on a pipe, what we would typically do is, let's say I have a five line set um, and I'm the flyman, I would drop that piece all the way to the floor and it would be tied on with clove hitches that would then be finished. And then I would tell the crew feet on and everybody on the crew would step onto the pipe and hold it against the floor while I take even tension on all of my five lines in the line set so that I know that at least at the beginning, I have a level trimmed, trimmed piece of pipe. Piece of and then you haul that up to, 
you know, usually waist high so people can do what they're going to do with it, hang, tie a drop on or hang scenery front or put lights on it. And while they're doing that, you've tied this line set off and you're setting your Sunday and your block and falls and your haul down line so that when they're ready, you can start hauling that line out. Yep. And hey, Eddie, um, yeah. if you look at the that one that you just see the top on right in the middle, that yep. has a collar on it. You see okay. that, Bill? No, no, down the one below it. You just yeah, right there is your. It collar. does look like that one has a collar on it. Yeah, there you I, go. I, I, it's hard to tell from the picture. Yeah. Cool. And there's a batten clamp. Right, doing the same thing as a cloth hitch. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where are we heading next? I'm fond of the cloth hitches. Uh, I am too, except except for. When they tie them in wire rope around the batten, I'm not a big yeah, fan. Yeah, well, that. That, no, not that. No. Different application. Yeah. Um, I put this photo in here, but I have no clue, you know, why, you know, what's going on here other than it's, 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 you know, the side, it's either upstage or it's more than likely one of the, one of the wings. Um, I couldn't figure out what was really going on. So I thought I'd throw it up to you folks and see if you had an idea what was going on. I've got a lattice track here that is handling a counterweight set, which could be for electrics. It's kind of mid house, so it's probably electrics more than anything else. I, yeah. Well, hey, unless yeah. unless that's the back wall, and that that could be the counterweight set for your paint frame. Yeah, but I don't see the paint frame. Well, it'd be below it. I don't see the lines for it either. Yeah. Well, it may have been taken out too. A lot of them did take them out. Yeah. Yeah. It, it may be, but you know, I'm not sure. Miguel, you're right. It does look like a fire curtain track, but they also used that style of track for act curtains. Um, uh, and in, in this particular house, they had, this is the Academy again, it was 95% rope system, but they did have a couple of, uh, of counterweight systems like this one. This one, it's not original issue, but you know, it's also, it's older than dirt anyway. <laughs> yeah, our, in the Geary Theater, we had two paint frames. Um, we had a catwalk, the, a walkway that walked between stage right and stage left against the upstage wall. There was a paint frame upstage of it and a paint frame downstage of it. And those were controlled by gigantic windlasses in the grid. They were about six feet in diameter, had rope, rope, a control rope wrapped around it, and then the lift lines for the paint frames. And the painters would literally haul, attach their dro drop to the paint frame, and then pull those ropes to lift them and lower them while they painted them from the back wall. Yeah. Another, another image, this is... You know, I think I think you might be right, Eddie, because this really does look like the back wall. And it looks like that same frame. Yeah. Yeah, right over here. Right. So the All paint right. frame, if they had one, would hang on the downstage side of that catwalk. Right. Right. And they replaced it with a traveler track. Right. Ooh. I tossed this photo in here because this was a, and still is, a relatively common way of hanging a bag but not with a sunday that's called a trim clamp um i i personally call them the clamps of death but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, they 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 really they really uh, you need to know what you're doing and you, you need to pay attention to make sure that these things will be to make sure that they function properly this one appears to be can barely see it, but one, two, three, four. There's five. It's a five-line clamp, so you run five lines through it, and there are spring-loaded fingers inside that would clamp uh, up against the rope, push the rope up against the side of this clamp, and the springs were held in place by the three bolts with the wing nuts on them. Um, if the springs weren't positioned properly, you could tighten down, but the clamp inside wouldn't tighten down. Um, People would not tighten these guys up enough, 
Um, so yeah, it held for a little while, but basically the wing nut was loose and then it would just spin itself off and fall down. Right. right. And then um, the ropes would run. Or they take them apart and the springs fall out. Yeah. And they can find them. Yeah. Um, M Miguel had a question about ask, asking about um, how do you feel about tying off to the handrail <laughs> instead of a pin rail? Um, yeah, that one. Not, not a big fan of no. that. <laughs> no. Um, Who knows what it's rated for? <laughs> exactly. But um, I don't know what it's holding either. It might just be a loose piece of rope that's tied off there so it doesn't get in the way. And that may be true. But one of the things about rigging that is important to me is developing good habits. Yeah. And those habits need to stick with you that you don't, you know, you, you don't veer away from those those habits without stopping to think about what you're doing. Right. Um, and it looks like, I mean, we've, we've got one, two, three, you got a, a line set or something. I bet that these lines are holding up one of these wooden battens here and it's an empty batten. So there's no big deal. That's not enough weight to do anything. We don't think, but somebody could come along and hang, you know, uh, uh, you know, some kind of a velour drop on there. It's going to put some weight on that railing. But, but you see how short those, lines are right you're right they can't be holding anything up because they wouldn't be able to let it in right there's no, not enough open. right i have no idea what it's doing right. <laughs> oh it may be holding the railing up guy we don't know oh there you go it could be um yeah i wanted to i, I got this to I put the put this one in the show this kind of kluge of of bag line and 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 jack Jack uh, Jack line in there. Um, I can't remember his name. I really wish I could. Um, local eight guy. Um, Twenty years ago. So, yeah, it's decorative. You're right. It's that's right that's a clue. <laughs> but it is a clue. Yes. I'm not sure what's going on there. Yeah. One of the things that you had to be really careful about uh, it. It, it kind of goes without, you'd think it's common sense and go without saying, but you don't want to run a bag down on top of a pin. Um, everybody's going to hate you. Anybody below the bag is going to hate you a lot. When you punch a hole in that bag and it starts losing sand, um, it, it's, it's not a good thing. It's once again, it points to maintaining control of your environment all of the time your your ropes are kept neat and orderly your bags are are kept in in the right line so their raising and lifting zones are going to keep them out of the way or you know that you've got this you know when the when 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 the, when the snowdrop bag uh sandbag comes in you know that that because of where you had to put it you're going to have to either land it on the fly gallery or make sure it goes you push it off stage or excuse me on stage of the flag gallery so that it passes the pins right you know it's just the simple little things that when you get into the heat of a show if you're not paying attention and if you haven't set it up properly you're going to make mistakes i mean yeah that sandbag hanging on a rolling hitch yep you know, I don't think we have a picture of a carpet batten in here, do we? I don't have one. I went looking. I couldn't find one. Yeah. It's, a carpet batten is a really interesting um, device or, or method, I should say, of being able to, especially like when we were doing shows in repertory, um, you needed to be able to sometimes take the piece of scenery off of the line set and suspend the sandbag or the counterweight separately from the line set so that you could then get those lines out of the way to do something else with. So, um, and, the, and the term comes from the vaudeville days when they used to have an act that had a large carpet that covered the stage and they wanted to fly that out. Um, when the, they would bring the carpet to the floor and then the sandbag itself would be hanging on a ring that went around the line set. So you would take all the tails and you'd pass them through a ring, usually about six inches in diameter, and your sandbag would hang on that ring. And you would take your haul down line or your sandbag line and tie it to that ring 
so that when the sandbag was in its highest position, you could actually tie off that sandbag. That ring rested on a clamp that went around the line set, sort of like the metal clamp uh, Bill pictured. What we used was two pieces of two by two that had uh, bolts going through them so we could clamp it securely around the line set. The ring would rest on that clamp when I wanted to be counterweighting my set. And when I didn't, I suspended the bag from the bag line and I could pull the line set that was clamped together so I didn't lose trim through the ring and have no weight on the other end or, or maybe just a couple of sandbags on the other end to counterweight it. So the way it would work is I have a 300 pound carpet that covered much of the stage hanging on this line set. When they wanted to put it on the stage, I would lower it to the floor, raise my sandbag, tie off the sandbag. They would unclamp the batten from the back of the carpet, lay it out, put some sandbags on the tails and, and I could fly them out of the way. And my sandbag, the counterweight sandbag was suspended by itself up in the air. And when we wanted to do the reverse, we would bring that clamp back up to the ring, which would bring the sandbags to the floor. The crew on the deck would untie the sandbags, hook it to the carpet. I would reland then my counterweight sandbag with the ring on top of that clamp. And it, now I would have a counterweighted set and I could lower, lower the sandbag and raise the carpet into a storage position. So you can use that for any number of things. You can actually do a carpet batten on a counterweight set. It's a, it's a little more difficult, but yeah. I was going to say, there's going to be a quiz at the end of this, this seminar. On oh God. Carpet. <laughs> you know, the, that a quiz is actually a, a test for the teacher as to how well you did yeah. <laughs> not necessarily the student. Exactly. Right. Um, the rest of the pictures that I have are, I think, more decorative in nature. Aww. You know, that's a chain fall. That's, you know, don't, this guy right here is a, a, a chain fall, not a block and tackle. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure it has a purpose, um, you know, but it's it's probably not a, a, a scenic element. It's not a show element. It's probably, you know, getting heavy equipment from the floor up onto um, onto the jump up onto the deck. Yeah, up on the fly loft. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if they used that to pull dimmers up, you know, when a, a touring show came in and they wanted to put their dimmers up on the on the fly gallery. I think I already had that picture, but you know, craziness in the uh, in the grid. And they're all wooden grids, by the way. Or they were. They were they back were. in the day. Yeah. We saw that picture before. That is, um, that's just a great shot, you know. This is a, um, this is a theater that's being built. And they put a double pin rail in along with a full counterweight system. Um, there's a salesman somewhere who was who was happy with the work that they did that day. It wasn't a renovation. I think that well, maybe this was a maybe this was a renovation, and they chose to keep the uh, the pin rail in there. Yeah, but that's what we did with the counterweight theory. system in. Yeah, having a, a a pin rail, at least a single pin, at least single rail, is always a good idea because you're going to need you know picks for stuff, even if it's just doing power feed uh, picks for your uh, lighting pipes. Right. Um, but the, the double, which is a great piece of equipment when that's the primary rigging system. Um, in this case, a double is you know, redundant if, if nothing else. So I want to tell that story about Tom Edwards here, Moose. Um, you see how there's a double rail here. And the lower rail sticks out a ways from the upper rail, uh, pin rail. So when I was a young pup back in the early 70s, uh, working at the Geary Theater, doing a load in, uh, the flyman at the time was a guy named Tom Edwards, whose nickname was Moose. Uh, Moose was about six foot four, went about 320 at least. Moose was the sound man on the first meeting of the UN at 
the San Francisco Opera House. That's how old Moose was. He was the flyman at the Geary back in the early, early days of his years. And so Moose was in his 70s at the time. And uh, I was down on the deck working and uh, Moose told the carpenter, send some, some kid up here for me. I need help. And so uh, my friend, who happened to be the carpenter at the time, said, all right, Moose is going to hand you a line set when you get up there. Five line set. He'll be holding it with one hand. Put your knees underneath the lower rail and grab on with both hands as hard as you can when he hands it to you. And I looked at him like, what? So I go up there and sure as hell, Moose is standing there and he's got a five line set in one hand. And he says, come here, kid, grab this. So I walked over and I tucked my knees under the rail and uh, grabbed his hold as tight as I could to the five line set and Moose let go. Well, he was holding about 200 pounds and I only weighed about 150 soaking wet at the time. Had I not locked my knees under the rail, I would have gone airborne. So Moose chuckled, looked at me and says, you're okay, kid, you can stay. <laughs> and took the line set from me again and you know, and I uh, <clears throat> stopped sweating quite so badly. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, it was, there were a lot of great old people who worked on the fly floors when, when we started in the, in the hemp house. We had three hemp houses when I started uh, in San Francisco. Um, we don't have any dedicated hemp houses anymore. But uh, that technology, that those practices, the all those methodologies apply to so many other things that I've done in my career. It's, it's, it's just a great background. It's too bad. We've lost so much of that. Yeah. I have one more photograph here and I can't tell what it is from my, on my little, my, my, my small, well, we'll just put it up there. Oh, okay. Yeah. I couldn't tell exactly what it was. And I was afraid that it was going to be something inappropriate, but it's not. Well, that's a scary picture. Yep. All those counterweight bricks stacked on the edge there. Well, what you can't see that well is there is a kick plate. Yeah. So in theory, they can't get, they can't go over, um, but they're stacked right to the top. This stack back here is probably stacked higher than the kick plate. It looks like it. Yeah. Yeah. Which is probably why this photo was taken. And I took it out of a, one of our safety inspections, but you know, it's got a nice, neat, uh, pin rail yeah. and, and, and a counterweight system because they're all single lines. I'm assuming that they're all spot lines. They're either holding power yeah. feeds for single uh, lines, right? cable picks. Yeah. Cable picks. So that's all the photos I've got. Do we have any, any hey, other? Any hey, other? Whoop. Hey, Bill. Could I bring up something, you know, on uh, on a rail like that where you stack the, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you fine. Okay. <laughs> you know, where you're stacking your bricks like that. I mean, this isn't such a bad thing, but when you go into a lot of the bigger <coughs> houses and they're all stacked like that, that that floor is rated per square inch and the weight put on there is as if it's loaded equally on some of the bigger houses is what I've been told when I looked into it. Do you have any thoughts on that? How well, to... the so what you're, if, if I understand you correctly, it's something that we've talked about it with other theaters that when they use when they stack all the weights, say over on one side, this is on the offstage side of the loading bridge, um, they're loading up the single beam underneath there and not mm -hmm. taking into consideration the beam on the other side. Is that what you're talking about? Well, actually, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's an evenly so, it's not an evenly distributed load. Right. Yeah, it was an evenly distributed load. That that was all. It was a uh, you know, and then I have a hard time with people stacking uh, bricks on the uh, off stage side because that's where people are sitting all the time to load the load them usually, so they well, get in the way. Yeah, that's a different situational. Anyway, I just wanted to say that they should be spread more evenly. In my exactly, opinion. one of the things that people forget about. And in the bigger house, it's a problem. This one, I don't think it's going to be a problem. But in a in a in a house with a lot of weight, they'll stack all of the weight on the onstage side of the loading bridge. 
when they designed that loading bridge and the engineers figured out its weight capacity, they weren't taking into consideration just the onstage beam that's running up upstage, downstage that's holding that thing. They they took the the two beams. But now you're just loading up everything on one side. And we've been in theaters where, you know, we've seen deflection in that onstage uh, I beam that's holding up the loading bridge because it's just got too much weight on it. And Alfred says, light stacked in the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right, Alfred, you know. The, the lights stacked in there. You start pulling on, you know, letting in some of those ropes, and all of a sudden you've got a, a six by nine Lico going up along with it. It's not a good thing. <laughs> Hi, Alfred. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you were with us. Alfred's yep. one of ours. Say that um, again, Yeah, no, the, he was just pointing out that we, we one of our newer theaters, uh, the Uruguayana Center for the Arts, has a pen, pen rails on both sides of the stage. Mostly they use for electrics. Right. Um, <laughs> for hall, for uh, cable picks and things. It's a convenience. You, you can convenient. rig with them. You know, and, you know, when, when you get a, a, a consultant that's, you know, been around and they're thinking about it, They'll do something like they've done here. You don't have the big double rail, where, which you don't really need, but you got a single rail. You need a railing over there, so let's make it useful. Let's make yeah. it do something. Yeah. We're, we're, we're wrapping up in time here, folks. Um, anybody got any other comments, questions, or things that we should be talking about? Okay, well. I'm going to have to learn to make cricket sounds. Yeah. Right. Um, what is this one? Scott. Thoughts about using it? Oh, I've seen, you're right. They do, it's kind of a hybrid counterweight and, and, and rope system. You got wire rope lift lines coming back to a clue. And then they tie a piece of rope on it, and you—that's you, how you operate it. And you, you hang a bag from the clue, um, or or two or three. It, you know, it works reasonably well, but there's never really enough space to get anything substantial out there. You know, you're, it's 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 going to be lightweight stuff. Ah. They're remodeling the house next door. Ah, okay. Are they using dynamite? Uh, no, but he's using a skill saw on the roof. Ah, okay. So, sorry about that. That's, you know, shit happens. I could throw something at them, but that would probably be a bad. Yeah. Not that guy. You don't, you don't want to do that. No. Okay. If, um, if that's it, Thank yeah, you all was, very I, much. Yeah, um, thank you. I had fun. I hope you guys learned something and enjoyed something it. And enjoyed it. Yeah. And um, we will catch up with you um, later. We don't have one. We don't have another Uncle Bill's session scheduled. Uh, we'll be doing them. It's just going to be a little bit more haphazard over the next couple of months as things start to get busy again. I've got to uh, pay attention to the day job a little bit. Thank you all. Have a good and safe afternoon, and uh, we'll take we'll talk to you later. All right. Thank, Thank you, later. guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, right. Bill. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys.